Welcome back, lesson seven. I'm glad to be back here with you. We're gonna jump right in. Remember, grab your books. If you don't have it, I'll give this video a pause. Uh, we're gonna begin by turning to page, um, we're gonna be turning to page uh, 32 and 33, and we're gonna read together the primary texts of the Christian faith. Uh, will you join me as we uh, read them out loud? The Ten Commandments preach repentance. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, honoring your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. The Apostles' Creed preaches the faith that saves us from our sin. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord's Prayer preaches the holy life. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The sacrament of holy baptism regenerates sinners and makes us Christians. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Confession and absolution return us to the promises of our baptism daily. The Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins, anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. The sacrament of the altar gives us the body and blood of Christ for our salvation. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you, this due in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it with all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Now we're going to jump right into our lesson. We're going to take a look at uh, today the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, um, I want you to uh, pay close attention. Uh, we're actually going to um, cover two whole chapters of, of this, uh, or almost two whole chapters. We're going to begin with the beginning of chapter 18. And I'm just going to walk us through the Bible text because I think that's just the best way uh, to discuss this. Our, our, our Learn by Heart section, uh, which you can find on page uh, um, 105, um, that I believe that Jesus, um, I, I uh, that that's the second article, uh, which continues, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and his, with his innocent suffering and death. Um, that honestly is, is probably my favorite section of the whole catechism, um, that the what does this mean part. Um, it, it, it brings so much joy um, and, and gladness to know that, that God uh, 
saved me in that specific way. It's it's the very it's the very heart of the gospel. So we're going to take a look at the Bible text because I think that that is so very important for us uh, to to take a look at. So um, I, I'll let you follow along with me. I'll I'll read it. I'll I'll comment on it. Um, you know, we're just going to go through this together. Um, I, I love it if you are with me and we could, you know, stop if you had any questions. But um, hopefully, I can at least um, I can at least think of what some questions might be in advance. Um, all right, uh, chapter eighteen of John, John chapter eighteen. When Jesus had spoken these words, I'm going to stop there already. We're already um, in the middle of, of some action. This is already after uh, the, they have the Lord's Supper, and Jesus prays this, this long prayer in John 17. It's often called the, the high priestly prayer. Uh, back in chapter 16, um, chapter, chapter 16, Jesus is uh, talking to the disciples, and he, he's trying to tell them what's going to come that uh, their sorrow is going to turn to joy, um, that he'll give them the Holy Spirit. And chapter 15 is the, the wonderful, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Uh, chapter 14, Jesus again promises the Holy Spirit um, and says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He also, uh, in chapter 13, tells of Peter's coming denial. That's going to come into play in chapter 18. Uh, Jesus um, Jesus uh, says, truly I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Now the rooster crows early in the morning, unless you have one of those roosters that crows all the time. But, you know, it will come into play in chapter 18. Uh, chapter 13, at the beginning, Jesus, um, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. He says, um, he says that uh, you must be, uh, you, you, in order to, to be his disciples, you, you need to to serve. You need to not think of yourself as greater than than anyone else. Um, and Jesus comes to serve and, and to demonstrate that he washes their feet. And then he also mentions that someone's going to betray, uh, betray him as well. So that's all happening in that upper room on Good Friday. And um, John 18 then picks up the story. It's late on Thursday night. Uh, it's after they have had supper. Um, and it, it's they didn't just have, you know, communion like we have communion. They had a whole meal, um, the, the, the Passover meal, uh, which was eaten rather quickly. Uh, but nonetheless, it was still... Um, it was, it was still a full meal for them. Um, so chapter 18, when Jesus had spoken these words, when, again, that's the prayer that he just prayed, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron where there was a garden. Um, now let's just pull up, um, I'll pull up my map here. Um, hopefully, uh, uh, where did my atlas go? Oh. See, this, this was ready for me right before, and now it's not. Um, oh, you are seeing exactly what I'm seeing right now. Well, I'm just going to go to another. Well, don't worry. We'll, we'll get it. Um, I want to give I want to give you an idea of where this all is. For me, I'm a I'm a I'm a maps guy. I like maps, um, you know. Um, so we're going to uh, we're going to go to where Jesus is betrayed, Garden of Gethsemane. Now, this is in Jerusalem. So they were inside the town in Jerusalem. They were inside the town. And then, um, then at, at the very 
uh, after they were done eating, they decided to, to go outside of the town. There was a garden area. Um, let's see here. All right, let's zoom in. All right, here we have, all right, I'm gonna zoom in. We can see as we zoom in, we're about as close as it's gonna let us go. So this is actually Jerusalem right here. And then you can see Gethsemane is the garden where they're at um, and the Mount of Olives. Um, and this little blue thing, that's the, the Kidron Brook. So uh, they'd have a little stream. It, it really, you know, in, in that time of year was actually probably likely completely dry. Um, but uh, uh, that's, where, that's where this is all taking place. It's taking place in this garden. So they have a view of, of the whole city. Um, but let's just go back. Um, so... Um, He went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Judas has already left the, uh, the, the, the rest of the disciples. He's now bringing uh, these these officers and soldiers soldiers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. That is, they're the temple guard. They are uh, a Jewish force. They're not uh, Roman soldiers. So you know, if you think about it, they're like the private security of the temple, going outside of the of the temple. Um, and and so really, you know, already this is telling us that there's that these guys don't actually have the authority uh, to do this, but they're still going to do it anyways. Um, then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who was betraying him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Why, why is this included here um when when they fell to the ground they, they they did so because jesus here is is using the the name for for god himself you know yahweh um and so when jesus says that it's not just a, a simple um it's not just a simple I, i'm the guy you're looking for it, it's 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 more of um, I, I'm going to use the, the divine name of God, and it's so holy that it's going to, you know, you know, make you fall to the ground. And, and so, um, you know, in, in a sense, this also shows just the very power that Jesus had. Just, just by simply saying God's holy name, Yahweh, uh, he, he prevented them from being able to do anything. And so really... We're going to see, uh, as Jesus is betrayed, that that he does uh, offer himself up willingly. So, uh, back to the text, um, verse 7 here. So, he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. And he spoke this um, back in the previous chapter in his prayer um, that, that he had not lost one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. I'm going to stop there now. One of the things that I, I think um, should draw our attention is whenever we have names, we have occasionally we have names of, of 
seemingly random people in these biblical accounts. And there's a number of Bible scholars that think that this is um, in part uh, to identify the witnesses of these events. John was there, obviously. He said, you know, he says that I have witnessed this, and we're going to see that at the end. Um, but he also names others that, uh, you know, people could go and they could ask, hey, Malchus, heard you got your ear cut off by Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he could say, well, yeah. And, and as, as we would find out in, in other um in other uh, gospels, like for example, in Luke chapter 22, um, uh, you know, it, it, we find that that they take some swords. Um, I'm trying to find where they where the other one is, um, but they uh, they actually um, Jesus actually heals uh, Malchus's ear. Um, I can't. Think off off the top of my head where where that reference is. I believe it's in Matthew, uh, where we find out that that uh, that Jesus heals the man's ear. Um, anyways, so you know th this this guy was was in the middle of it, and he was also the high priest servant, so he was a well known dude. Um, uh, Caiaphas, Ananias, uh, um, Caiaphas, who was was the priest, the high priest that year. Um, so it would be Caiaphas's servant. Um, so this is like, um, you know, I, I'm trying to think of a good example. You know, our, our president often has, um, you know, press secretaries and cabinet members that have really a high, um, a high, uh, they have a high position where, where everyone knows who they are, um, you know, and, and, and so, uh, and you, you get to know these names, um, you know, right now, uh, one of the big names uh, that our current president has is his own personal lawyer. So this isn't even a government position, but it's Rudy Giuliani, who was, of course, mayor of uh, New York uh, during the September 11th attacks. So a well-known guy. So it would be, you know, it would be like today if we were to say, uh, make reference to, uh, you know, Giuliani in this case, you know. Um, but nonetheless, so... Let's let's continue here. So Jesus said to Peter, "Put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me?" In his previous prayer, Jesus was asking, uh, "Let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done." Um, so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Uh, that is quite a, um, quite a statement. This was back in chapter 11, um, when Caiaphas, he's addressing the rest of the, uh, um, rest of the Pharisees, and uh, he says, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Uh, this is prophetic, isn't it? Um, and in fact, John makes a point of saying this. He did not say this of his own accord, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So John recognized that this was a prophecy, um, and and Caiaphas was the one that said it. Um, so he, John wants us to remember that prophecy that Jesus is going to die for uh, for the nation and for all people. Remember, Jesus predicted that Simon would deny him. Now, Simon Peter, uh, we find out exactly how that happens. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, uh, we, we assume that this is John. John doesn't use his own name in his gospel, um, except when he lists them all. Um, so, he that is Simon Peter entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the, or he that is the, 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 the disciple entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. 
The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, that is, Peter said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers made a charcoal fire because it was cold. They were standing and warming themselves. Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. So we've got one, one time where Peter has already denied Jesus. Well, the high priest questions Jesus. The high priest then questioned Jesus and his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered them, I've spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is it is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong, but if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And here we, we already begin to see how Jesus uh, is mistreated uh, by those who, who ha are holding him captive. Um, there was no, there was no, um, you know, there, there needs to be a trial before before punishment. Um, but the the guard, the officer, took it upon himself to begin beating Jesus right there. It just sounds like one strike, but still one punch can uh, can hurt quite a bit. Um, so um, Jesus goes to the high priest, and now we go back, we switch scenes again, back to Peter. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. Remember, they were by the fire. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the dis servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. I, I just can't imagine what, what Peter felt. Um, must have felt like the, the worst person on earth to deny Jesus three times and saying, surely I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't deny you. And then he does. Um, we, we know that, that that made him you know run away from there. Um, but, but God's not done with Peter. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we're not going to get to that part where Jesus restores Peter, but uh, uh, he will be restored, and Jesus will instruct Peter to to feed my lambs, um, and 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 therefore uh, Jesus wants Peter to continue that ministry. So Jesus is now before Pilate. We're switching scenes again. John does this a lot. He kind of does back and forth. You've seen this in movies. It makes things really exciting. Uh, when you kind of have two things going on at the same time, um, that's the way you do it. So, Jesus before Pilate. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. Now, you might be wondering, didn't Jesus and the disciples eat the Passover already? And there's two different explanations of this, and, and, and both are, I think, uh, plausible. Uh, the first is that uh, the, the actual meal that Jesus and the disciples ate wasn't the actual Passover meal itself. It was a kind of preparation meal, or they, they had, in, in, in a way, Passover early. Um, that's, that's one explanation. The other explanation was that there were uh, a few different schools of thought as to when Passover should be celebrated, uh, what time of the day, and what time, um, what time it would go go on. And then there's actually a third one, and that is that Passover actually is a, one of these holidays, kind of like actually Christmas and Easter. You know, they're not just a one day thing; there are many days, and, and so there was to be meals every single day after Passover. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that's what John meant. So you can pick any one of these, but it, it's, it's you know, this isn't, you know, this isn't saying that, that John didn't know what he was talking about. And, you know, there was, there was, a, there is a reasonable explanation that the people at the time of this gospel, the time that this was written, that they would easily have known. Um, 
but we're 2,000 years separated from it. So it's a question that comes up. So Pilate went outside and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. Jesus said to him, It is not lawful for us to put... I'm sorry, the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fill the word that Jesus had spoken to show what kind of death he was going to die. And we have lots of those. Um, you know, Jesus says, I'm, when I'm lifted up from the earth, uh, I will draw all people to myself. Um, he said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. We also see uh, Jesus um, saying um, that, uh, that, that he would be delivered over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, crucified and will be raised on the third day this is again before jesus was betrayed so uh we we have jesus saying a number of times this is how it's going to happen and it's going to be at the hands of the gentiles um that is the romans so uh so pilate entered his headquarters again and called jesus and said to him are you the king of the jews jesus answered do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it about me? Pilate again answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Now, there's there's a whole bunch of references uh, where, we, where we talk about the kingdom of God um, and, and and I think uh, um, you know one of the things that Jesus mentioned um, says the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, "Look here it is or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. That is when Jesus was, preaching that was god's kingdom or that was god's reign when we often see that phrase kingdom of god we should really be thinking not of place but of activity um you know the kingdom is where the king rules and really that the word in the greek actually even has more of that emphasis on the activity uh, but my reign is not from the world um, so that might be um more helpful um, so Pilate continues questioning. So Pilate said to him, So are you a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Now, this is actually... Um, you know, Pilate is, it could well be just as, as you know, people today. You know, they always, you know, there, there's a common question, you know, what is truth? How do we know what is true? Um, you know, and, and, and this is actually an important question. What is truth? How do we know what is true? Um, Jesus tells us that the word of God bears witness to the to the truth that jesus has come into the world to bear witness to the truth that in fact um in fact jesus makes it very clear that um that uh oh, i'm trying to find that verse uh let's see here that Jesus himself is the, the way, the truth, and the life. I forget. Oh, that's John. I think that's John chapter 10, isn't it? Oh. Anyways, it's John. I believe it's John 10. Let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. John chapter 14. See, that's why we have a search function on here. <laughs> Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, so that's what Jesus is getting at here. 
uh, when he says, I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Who, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. If, if, if we want to know what is true and certain uh, more than anything else in this world, uh, we ought to pay attention to God's word. Um, I'm going to pause from our reading here because this is an important uh, this is an important point because in today's age we have um, we do have a lot of people saying that God's word isn't true. Um, you know, evolution is one aspect, but uh, morality is another. You know, people saying, well, um, marriage can be whatever you want it to be. It can be between two men or two women. Um, that, in fact, even the whole idea of man and woman isn't necessarily a true idea. Um, all of this is 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 a corruption. Um, you know, it, it's you know. Remember what Satan said back in the Garden of Eden? Did God really say? Um, if we want to know what's true, uh, we look to God's word. And I think then what we do is when we're confronted with things that don't seem to match up. For example, you know, we have uh, the Bible gives us an account of creation that is six days, and then it gives us a history of of the world that's only thousands of years you know maybe up to eight thousand years or so old um and and so the question should be you know and if you want to be a good scientist i don't think this is something that prevents you from being a scientist it should be this um since god's word says this how can i understand the world which seems to be saying something else for example for example um, at one point in time uh, based on a miss uh, by a misinterpretation of scripture um, when Joshua caused the the sun to stand still um, some believed that that the that that meant that the sun had to go around the earth um, and Galileo got in trouble with this. Um, you know, so one, we have to question, you know, is, is our is our interpretation of scripture, is that is that what the text is actually saying? But the text uh, in some cases is just very, very clear. Uh, but two then, um, maybe maybe our own scientific understanding is not accurate. Um, and, and guess what? The, the whole pursuit of science, for those that you that love science, is really one of, of constantly going back and checking the previous assumptions. Were we right about that? Um, scientists, for example, the speed of light. The speed of light is thought to be the, the, the absolute limit. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light, except when it goes faster than the speed of light. Uh, we've actually had scientists that have questioned, is the speed of light the absolute, is, is that the fastest that anything can go? And they did experiments that showed that they could push little particles of light photons to actually bend in a way that they'll go faster than light. Um, and now that, that, that's the summary and, and the details of it are beyond what I know. Um, we're going to stop at this time. Um, I'm going to pause because I want you to pick up your pencil. And remember how we do these words? I want you to write down the word light. L-I-G-H-T, light. Now write down the word light. That's our first word, okay? So, as I was saying, the speed of light uh, was thought to be, you know, that, that, that firm boundary, but we have some experiments that, that might, you know, suggest that we can go that there, th there there's a possibility of things going faster than that um, I think the same thing is with all science you know we can always continue to uh, question and discover we, we, we are able to observe what we're, we're able to observe but sometimes our, our our conclusions that are drawn from the observations are not always accurate and I, I think in the end God's word is going to always uh, be shown to be true. Um, and so uh, to answer Pilate's question, what is truth? Uh, ultimately, God is truth. 
Let's pick up with our, our reading here. After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. So here, Pilate pronounces the verdict. The verdict for Jesus' trial is this, not guilty. That's important. Even Pilate is saying that Jesus is innocent. But he continues, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at Passover. So you do want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Um, and I, I think this is a, a bad translation of the word. Um, the word there, um, it's a uh, lestes. Uh, it's a uh, word, uh, it can be used as a, like a... a like a highway bandit, someone that would like, you know, um, would, would capture uh, by, by violence uh, people and sometimes even murder them for their stuff. Uh, but another another word for this is is a, um, well, some, some will say a revolutionary, but I think this should be understood as terrorist. Barabbas, I, and I think that's how, if I were to translate the meaning of this word, because I think this is what John wants us to get to understand, Barabbas was a bad, bad, bad guy. Um, he was, you know, a terrorist. It'd be like saying, you know, <laughs> we want we want you to release Osama bin Laden, although bin Laden was killed back uh, in, what, 2014. Um, but... Uh, so that's that's who they want. They want they want Barabbas instead of Jesus. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. Remember, Jesus is pronounced innocent, and now he's getting a, a punishment. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. Purple was, by the way, the 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 thing that showed people that uh, someone was a king. I want you to stop right now. I want you to pick up a pen or a pencil, and I want you to write down our second word, and that's going to be the word purple. Our second word is purple. Okay? Verse 3. Then they, they came to him saying, Hail, king of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See? I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Now this is an important, I'm going to stop here again. This phrase where Pilate says, Behold the man, uh, is very, very important. Um, not only because... Um, because you know he's he's showing them the guy that they they want uh, to eventually crucify, but also because Pilate does kind of what Caiaphas did, as we talked about earlier. Um, God uses an unbeliever here to to give a prophetic word. Uh, Behold, the man ties us back to Genesis. Genesis 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Behold, the man is tying it back to this Genesis. And, and actually, Paul makes a point of this in Romans. Um, in Romans chapter, I believe it's chapter 5. Uh, yeah. Or maybe... All right, so we're going to do this again. See, I, I'm, I'm always bad with my chapter and verses. So if you're ever bad with chapter and verses, don't ever worry. Um... There we go. 
death in Adam, life in Christ. This is Romans chapter 5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for indeed sin was in the world before well all was again. Um, so uh, let's, you know, uh, sin came into the world through one man. That's the main thing you want to get. Um, The free gift is not like the trespass. Um, if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of grace of that one man, behold, the man, Jesus, uh, by the gift of grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Um, and uh, so... We have the, this conclusion. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to the justi justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. If you want a verse to memorize, uh, Romans 5.19 is a good one to put on your list. Um that's a very important verse. Uh, we, we, we all die. We all have sin. We're made sinners because of Adam's sin. But we are also made righteous because of Christ and faith in him. So, back to John 18. Or John 19, actually, I should say. We, uh, we, uh, we were talking about behold the man in verse 5. Now, Six. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Now, it's, again, this is important. It's the chief priests and the officers that are crying this out. It's not necessarily... In, in, some, in some hymns, they, they want to tie uh, the, uh, um, the people that were saying, Hail, Hosanna! on Palm Sunday to the exact same people that were saying crucify. And I don't know if that's necessarily the case, but I think it is a helpful thing for us to understand uh, that, that we ourselves, by our own sin, cry out, crucify Jesus. Um, so we might as well have been there with them saying. So... Um, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Again, Pilate uh, proclaims Jesus' innocence. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He enters at headquarters, again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate was was afraid. We actually find out, I believe again, it, it's in, in Luke's gospel that, that Pilate's own wife warned Pilate to have nothing to do with Jesus uh, because, um, you know, there's a tradition that Pilate's wife actually became a Christian um, whether that happened before or afterwards, or whether that actually happened, we don't really know. But it's one of those one of those um, stories that are told outside the Bible. So we don't have a, you know, it's not the Word of God that tells us that. But we do know um, that the pilot is, you know, really now afraid. Um, even even if Pilate was, you know, holding to the Roman, you know, where they have the pantheon of gods. Um, you know, if, if he's going to do this to someone that's claiming to be God, I, he's probably thinking, well, what if, what if he's actually who he says he is? What if he's who they say he is? Or at least who they say he's claiming to be. Um, and this is, this is important. Jesus claimed to be the son of God. He was very clear about that. Um, it was, all, you know, the, the claims of Jesus that he makes when he says, before Abraham was, I am, that was a statement where he clearly indicates that he is God, uh, or that he believes that he is God. Um, you know, and the question is, do you believe that or not? Um, and if you believe that, well, 
what difference does that make in your life? Uh, so Pilate said to him, you will not speak to he me, for Jesus remained silent. This is uh, a reminder of, of what, uh, um, what Jesus, uh, what, what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 53. We're jumping all over the Bible uh, here. Um, Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. And just imagine, right now, Jesus has been whipped already and flogged. Um, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as one from whom... Men hid their face, hide their face as he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Okay? Yet he opened not his mouth. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus doesn't give an answer to Pilate. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at, at all unless it were it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, I'm going to pause there again. You know, this is important. All authority that government has comes from God. Um, you know, they, the, the authority of the government doesn't come from the people, despite what um, our, our own political philosophy says ultimately the authority anyone who is who is an authority has comes from God uh, because God is uh, fathering and Lord over all from then on verse 12 from then on Pilate sought to release him but the Jews cried out if you release this man you are not Caesar's friend everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to be crucified. So here we have uh, now, the even though Jesus has been proclaimed innocent, he is going to pay the penalty for being the king of the Jews and for being the son of God. Um, so the one thing we, we, we I didn't mention, which I mentioned in class, and I'm going to do this now, is is that we have to understand that that when Jesus is is crucified, it is a it is a really a brutal scene. Um, we we read earlier that Jesus was whipped, and I'm going to kind of just draw you kind of an example of what that whip looked like. I'm not the best artist. You all know this. But it was called the cat of nine tails because it was a whip that had seven, eight, nine. Had nine different, um, nine different, uh, um, can you, hopefully you'll be able to see it. I'll, I'll actually, here, if I, if I do this, you might see it much, much better. There we go. So it, it's a whip that had nine ends on it. And each of the ends had a sharp, uh, piece of metal or glass, you know, it would have been like in a diamond or triangle, something that would have, they could have tied around it. And uh, and the whole purpose, the whole purpose then was to 
not just to 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 cut but actually to to grab hold and to kind of tear chunks of flesh off um so when we, we next we're going to hear about jesus you know um carrying his cross he's doing this after having lost a ton of blood he has um He's been beaten nearly to death already. He doesn't have much, much uh, energy in, in him already. And, and other gospels actually tell us that that another man um, actually ends up carrying Jesus' cross uh, much of the way. So, uh, but we're, we're in John's gospel. That's what we're looking. At. You know, each of the gospels gives us a little bit different account of Jesus' crucifixion. It's kind of like with rainbows. Um, do you know that no two people can ever see the same rainbow? In fact, your own eyes see a slightly different rainbow. That is because the light that is being refracted into those colors, uh, the beams of lights that are hitting this eye and the beams of light that are hitting this eye are actually different. And so the position of of the rainbow itself is different and so um with the reason why i i, I use that as an example uh, or, or maybe like a diamond something that has you know all those little facets you know if you if you look at it from one one perspective it might look um well here let's let's do a drawing let's do another one of my famous wonderful drawings so you know, one of those cut diamonds, you might want to check out your mom's wedding ring or engagement ring that she had. You know, they often will look like this. And I'm really not a good drawer, you know. You know, they're going to have things like this. You know, you, you get it. So that's one view of it. Um, but, you know, if we were to turn it, it might have a round shape from the top and have, you know, all these cuts that are like this. And so the diamond might look like this from another angle. So that's what we have with the Gospels. We have the Gospel writers giving us um, not different stories, but they're giving us two different viewpoints of the same, you know, list of events. And so sometimes it's kind of hard to kind of put them all together um, and find out what exactly goes with what, um, because really we're dealing with two two-dimensional uh, views. Uh, that is, two different witnesses. Uh, we can piece things together somewhat, but there is still a little bit of, um, you know, for example, Jesus says seven words from the cross. What's the order that he says them? Well, we can get pretty close, but not, you know, we, we don't necessarily, we aren't able to get them all in perfect order. Um, and that's okay. Uh, it doesn't change the meaning. Um, but I just wanted you to, I wanted to talk about that because that is kind of an important thing. So Jesus was bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Now, this is really important. Um, check this out. Uh, we have in our in our book. Um, so we have right here. If you see right, I'm doing this. this is all backwards for me, and I'm doing it right there. If you see right there, right there. You see that little thing right there? That's a skull. Why a skull? There was a tradition that that place, Golgotha, was the place where Adam's bones lay. Now, we really don't know because there was a flood, um, but it has at least a nice symbolic thing. Remember what we talked about when Pilate said, Behold the man? So, we have... Uh, at least a connection. So that's why you might you might see in some artwork a lot of times there is a sometimes a skeleton or sometimes just a skull because it is the place of a skull, uh, and that skull is supposed to represent Adam. I mean Adam really represents all of mankind. Um, 
So that's the significance of, of the place of the skull. There they crucified him and with two others, back to our text here, with two others, one on either side, Jesus between them. Um, and Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. I want you to stop here. I want you to pick up a pencil or pen, and I want you to write King, K-I-N-G. That's our third word, K-I-N-G, King, okay? Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests and the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots to see whose it shall be. The reason why they did this, by the way, was because such a piece of fabric would be worth a lot of money, uh, having no seam. Um, this was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. That's from Psalm 22. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. This is a very important part. Um, when Jesus uh, says, says uh, behold your, your son and behold your mother, uh, what he is, he is saying is that he is placing, um, well, he's placing his mother, first of all, um, who it's pretty clear is now a widow, um, into the care of John. Uh, John stands in for all of the disciples, all the apostles. John stands, in a sense, as in for all pastors. Um, and Mary stands in place for the whole church. So, um, you know, this is important. All pastors come from within inside the church. Um, but the charge is, is that, John, you're going to take care of Mary now. Um, and from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Uh, but it also shows us kind of the relationship of the church, that pastors are to kind of regard uh, the church as, as, as mother. Um, and um, and it, it's, it's supposed to be a, uh, a loving relationship, one of caring for and making sure everyone has everything that they need. Um, not, not everything they want, but everything they need. Um, so uh, this also hints at the fact that, that Jesus' brothers and sisters that were mentioned, in, for example, in Matthew, uh, that they were likely, uh, that word for brother and sister, it's wide. It can be stepbrother um, and, or even cousin or even someone that just lives in the household. So it, it is likely, as, as many of the stories outside of the Bible uh, tell us, that that Joseph was previously married, and so um, Mary didn't have any other children. If her if her only son dies, like the woman in Nain, uh, she'd have no one to care for her. Um, so Jesus makes sure that she is cared for. Um, whether or not uh, Mary had any other children uh, through through giving birth to them, or was kind of a stepmother, uh, we really don't know for a hundred percent sure. Um, I, I tend to believe that this this kind of does show in the Old Testament sense that Jesus is making sure that his mom is being cared for uh, by by 
in a sense, an adopted son. Now to the death of Jesus. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. This is from another psalm. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me cellar wine to drink. This is from Psalm 69. A jar full of cellar wine stood there. Vinegar. So they put a sponge of full of cellar wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the cellar wine, he said, It is finished. This is a very important word. This word is a... Um, is is what's called a perfect word. It's in the perfect tense. That means that it it's an action that has completed in the past, but has enduring and forever reaching results. Um, so you could might want to translate because it could even be translated. It is finished and will always be finished. In other words, everything that was needed for your salvation has been accomplished and is done. Mission accomplished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other two who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. At once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you may believe. For these things took place that the scripture may be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And another scripture says they will look on him whom they have pierced. All right, that's where we're going to stop. Jesus is crucified, and he is, and he has died. Um, he he's pierced in the side, and this shows us the very nature of Jesus' death. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the death on of crucifixion is is just a horrible death. It's probably one of the most torturous deaths that someone could die. And this is kind of gross, kind of like the whipping was kind of gross. Uh, not kind of. If, if you were there, it would be very gross. I, I would not be able to hold it together. Um, but, you know, the, those that were crucified would be pierced. Um, we have evidence, actually, of even piercing up here in the hand. So if you ever see some of those old, um, old uh, you know, where, where they where they show, you know, Jesus' own, like, palm being, being uh, uh, pierced, it could also be here. This is also part of the hand. Um, um, you know, it would... A nail would be able, or you know, this would be able to hold up more weight. But we actually found uh, in in a um, ossuary, which is called, it's a bone box. You know, people would be buried, and then they their bodies would be left to decay, and then their bones would be collected years and years later and put into a box. Uh, we found one where the the bone of the of the ring or middle finger here. Um, was actually um, fused with a nail that was used for crucifixion right in this area. Um, and, and so we actually have archaeological evidence that that's one way that they did it. They also used ropes and stuff. But anyways, the, the thing is, is that in order to breathe, and this is, this is how uh, the cross works, in order to breathe, you'd have to push up with your feet that have been pierced with a nail and so all your weight is going on through that nail and also being pulled up on your hands in order to get air into your lungs so you can breathe and then you speak that's why when jesus speaks he speaks in you know very short sentences you know that word it is finished uh is actually just one word it's tetelestai um and so the way that Jesus dies, uh, we actually have a medical uh, we, have, we actually have a medical explanation. Uh, when his side is pierced, he's already dead. Uh, blood and water come out. That means that Jesus died of uh, of asphyxiation uh, and of a heart attack. 
Um, that's that's what happens. Your your blood starts to separate after after death. Um, but it also has a symbolic meaning too, and I think this is really important. Um, in fact, I, I, I wish to. Uh, there's a wonderful. Um, there's a wonderful altarpiece uh, by by Martin Chemnitz. Um, or not 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 by I'm sorry not Chemnitz by Cronach Lucas Cronach, who was the uh, um, who was the the painter of of the Reformation. And I'm just going to. Uh, It's it's in the the city of Weimar, okay, and I'm gonna see if I can switch here, and it's really an impressive, um, it's an impressive, uh, um, it's an impressive piece because, um, let's see here, um. Because this uh, this piece kind of gives us an idea, all right. Um, we, we see this in, in a few different places. So let me switch to it here. All right. So let's take a look at this. Um, this uh, this piece shows us um, this this right here is, is um, Martin Chemnitz. Uh, who who commissioned this piece? This is Luther right here. Of course, this is Jesus. This is where he's pierced, and 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 it shows the blood pouring onto Chemnitz. In other um, in other drawings where it shows the crucifixion of Jesus, it might even show uh, the blood uh, pouring into a chalice, a communion chalice, and the water into a baptismal font. Uh, that's that gets us to uh, why Jesus, or you know, you know what 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 the water and the blood mean is is really that it reminds us how are we saved? We are saved by by Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Um, so uh, that that is you know. When, when, so that when we talk about like things like baptism, baptism saves, or, or that that Jesus says that when we receive the Lord's Supper, that it's for forgiveness, uh, for our sins. The reason why is because those things deliver to us the very thing that that Jesus accomplished on the cross, and it connects us to the crucifixion. It connects us to our salvation. Um. So. Real quick, and we, um, you know, we've having covered all this from, you know, from the the scriptural story, we've actually covered this quite well already. Um, but uh, there, there's there's an important um, part of our, you know, back in in our small catechism. Yeah, this way. This is all reversed on me when I'm looking at the screen. So left is right, and so forth. Um, when we say that Jesus has redeemed me a lost and condemned person, this means I'm a sinner, and we all believe that, that he's purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his precious blood, his innocent suffering and death. The word redeemed is a very important word. The word redeemed. Um, and uh, I just want to take our last little bit to talk about this word. This word redeem, it, it is a it is a word which actually has a legal significance to it. Um, in Jesus' day, there was slavery, um, and it was a little bit different than it was in the United States. But one thing that a person could do is that they could either um, save money and they could purchase their own freedom if they were a slave, or someone else could purchase their own freedom. Um, and and that freedom was called their redemption, and it would come, you know, in a it would come in a piece of paper, you know, that would, that would say, 
all the different things. Because you know, here's the thing: the slaves often were were marked, physically marked, um, with with a uh, kind of like a branding, or they would have you know, you know, like you've seen those uh, um, people that have you know the earrings that that have you know wide gauges. Um, you know, they have certain piercings that even if you took the ring out, um, you know, you you would you would see the you would see the scars, you would see the marks of slavery. And so be clear, even if you traveled, you know, all the way across the Roman Empire, you were a slave at one point. But if you had this letter of redemption, you could show it when you entered a city, you could show that letter of redemption that you were a free person. How cool is that? Then you were you would be recognized as a freedman um, and you would have um, certain rights and privileges uh, that that others did not, um, including uh, including the uh, in some cases even being a citizen of Rome, uh, which was a big deal. Um, so when when we talk about that Jesus has redeemed me, a lost and condemned sinner, that means that that you and I were slaves to sin. This is something Scripture teaches. We were slaves to sin, but we have been redeemed. In other words, our, our freedom has been bought. But it wasn't bought with gold or silver like the slave redemption was. It was bought with the very precious blood that Jesus spilt uh, in his suffering and death on the cross. That was the price for our freedom. That was the price of our salvation. And... and you know, this is this is the the analogy. You know, if you were a slave and someone bought your freedom, not only do we find out that that we are free, but God then adopts us into His family. You know, it's like, you know, you are a slave, but then the King buys your redemption and says, "Oh, by the way, you're now part of the royal family. You re will receive the inheritance of this kingdom." And so, I want you to be part of my family, the king says to you. Um, and we're going to do things uh, as a family. And the thing that we're going to do is we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna love God and love our neighbor. That's what we're going to do. Um, we're we're going we're gonna to become rulers. We're going to rule. And, you know, this might sound strange. I know you came out of slavery, but we're going to do this out of our freedom we're, we're going to live our life to serve our neighbor so that we can love them. That's that's kind of what the Christian story is. You've been purchased out of the slavery of sin. There's nothing you have to do to become part of God's family. Um, that's been done for you. Now God calls you to be part of his family, uh, to, to love your neighbor. Um, and so we do this out of our freedom, so insofar as we are, 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 you know, insofar as the new man lives in us, insofar as Christ lives in us, uh, we, we gladly then take on the, the form of Christ who came as a servant for us so that we would be servants of others and that others might see the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. A lot of stuff we covered. I thank you for sticking through this. Uh, I will post uh, both the, the, the Learn by Heart quiz for, uh, for the catechism. Um, I should have at the beginning said do, do it beforehand, but if you haven't done it already, do it. It's only the stuff that's on page 105. Um, so you don't have to worry about the other stuff. It's only the stuff that's, that's under the second article on page 105. Um, and then also I'll, I will post the video uh, quiz with our three keywords. You know, if you didn't get them, I, I paused long enough. You'll have to go back and you'll have to watch again. Um, I'll give you a hint. The first one was right around about a half hour. Uh, so, um, you know, you got to make it halfway through before you even get the first one. Um, but uh, uh, the Lord bless and keep you, and we'll see you soon. If you can make it to class, I really would love to see you guys there. Uh, Lord bless and keep you. Bye.